In 1912, a donation of two and a half million dollars was made to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology from an anonymous Mr. Smith. This was the largest donation up till that point MIT had ever received. As no one knew who Mr. Smith was, many people started trying to guess. The mysterious Mr. Smith enjoyed himself as newspapers, higher social circles, and education circles all joined in on the speculation. At one point, two millionaires living in New York went to dinner together, both suspecting that the other was Mr. Smith. However, all they left with was a large amount of respect for the other person's bluffing ability. Eight years of speculation, and $20 million in donations later, Mr. Smith was revealed to be George Eastman, founder of the Eastman Kodak Company. Throughout his life, Eastman donated $100 million to various causes, equivalent to $1.5 billion today. Who was this man who became rich enough to give away this much money? How did he make it? And why did he give it all away? George Eastman started on a stable career path to becoming a successful banker. By the time he was 21, he was earning more than $1,000 a year. He had an active social life, going on dates to art galleries, the first passenger elevator, and museums. Around this time, he was pursuing a woman who wanted a music career. As Rochester didn't have a music school, she left to study in Europe. This hit Eastman hard. Not long later, looking to get into the real estate market, Eastman became interested in Santo Domingo. The US was considering setting up a naval base nearby, resulting in a lot of speculation about the land prices there skyrocketing. As Eastman planned a trip there, a friend recommended taking a camera with him to record his experience. Instead of going on his trip, this led Eastman to become completely absorbed in his hobby of photography. Photography at this time had some issues. In Eastman's own words, it was intricate, cumbersome, and the expense also was considerable. You had to carry around many different items, and when you actually got to taking your photos, it relied on a lot of speed and skill. The plates you used in photography were coated in iodide and a solution of cellulose nitrate. Then, in a dark room, which you had to bring with you, you submerged your plates in silver nitrate, which would react to coat the plates with silver iodide. And then you put your plate in a camera and took your photo. You weren't done yet though. You had to pour a developing agent called pyrogallic acid over the plate, which turns the silver halides into silver metal. This works faster on the halides that were exposed to more light. You then added a photographic fixer, either potassium cyanide or sodium theosulfate, which removes the silver that hasn't yet reacted with the pyrogallic acid. That's a complicated process. And to top it all off, you had to do all of this in about 10 to 15 minutes. At this time, Eastman was paying for lessons from experienced photographers, reading photography manuals, and subscribing to journals about photography. Whenever he wasn't working, and sometimes when he was, he was living and breathing photography. The first edition of the British Journal of Photography he read contained an interesting new development called dried plates. These decreased the time and effort you had to spend on this hobby. Now, Eastman started working on developing and refining his version of the technique for his benefit. When he got home from working at the bank, he would start on his experiments. He made some progress, but his new formula was difficult to apply to the plates. To make the process more efficient, he set up a machine that would coat the plates for him. Soon, he began to realise he could set up his own business selling these plates. Word soon got around about Eastman's high quality plates, and so his business began to grow. He hired several people, including his cousin Eliza Tompkins, to coat the plates, keep the books, and do the packing while he worked at the bank. Eastman still needed a large amount of money to upscale his business. He negotiated with Edward and Henry Anthony, who bought some of his plates, but it wasn't until he met Henry Strong that things really sped up. Henry Strong was in business with a large whip-making company, which produced nearly a million a year. 
A risk taker, looking out for new ways to make money, he soon spotted Eastman, and they quickly grew close. Their company began to grow more as Strong invested a lot of money into it, with Eastman eventually quitting his job as a banker in 1881. This was partly because Eastman, the most qualified for the job of supervisor, was ignored and instead a relative of one of the directors was given the job. However, he soon ran into trouble. A number of his plates had failed and there was no pattern as to why. Eastman had never guaranteed that the plates would work, so he could have given up and gone back to working at the bank. However, instead he refunded the cost of the plate and started experimenting to find a solution, eventually sleeping in his factory to spend more time on the problem. After 469 failed attempts, Strong and Eastman sailed for England, their source for the ingredients. Quickly, he worked out that they had switched where they got some of them from, which caused the failures. Many years later, a laboratory found that the new source was missing sulphur, which was the ingredient that made the plates work. After getting back into business, he met William Walker, a talented man, but one who struggled to get along with other people. They started working on photographic film, a cheaper and simpler method of photography. This invention started opening up the hobby to a wider audience. Throughout Eastman's life, he continually decreased the barrier to entry to photography, and therefore created a larger market for him to sell to. In 1885, Eastman received the unfortunate news that his camera infringed upon the patents of a man named David Houston. Over the next few decades, he was a major difficulty for Eastman, as he had to pay royalties and settle lawsuits, with this continuing even after Houston's death. Eastman soon became interested in developing a lightweight camera he could sell to the general public. The professionals and hobbyists already in photography were happy to keep using the old plate method, as they had the experience and equipment necessary to use them. He hired the experienced chemist Henry Reichenbach to work on this while he started focusing on his advertising. By 1888, this had become a reality. With 100 frames of film, the Kodak camera sold for $25, equivalent to $800 in 2023. After taking the photos, you mailed the camera back to Kodak, and for $10, $320 in 2023, they would develop your photos and give you a new roll of film. The Philadelphia photographer called it a model of compactness, neatness, and ingenuity. Henry Strong also loved the camera. He had never expected to actually do any photography, but as soon as he started using it, Eastman said that he never saw anyone so pleased over a lot of pictures before. His success surprised everyone. By August, he couldn't keep up with the orders, and within six months, he sold 5,000 cameras and made $250,000. Eastman's brilliant advertising method caused his Kodak cameras to become a cultural phenomenon. He focused on its simplicity and made it into a stylish hobby that everyone was involved in. Eastman's initial slogan was photography reduced to three motions, those being pull the cord, turn the key, press the button. This was eventually simplified to, you press the button, we do the rest. This was a camera that anyone could use, and was in stark contrast to the days of photography just 10 years ago, when only professional photographers and experienced hobbyists had a camera. The classic Kodak woman is the best example of the stylish nature of the Kodak. Always looking like the most fashionable woman there was, if she was doing it, you definitely should be too. We also see a couple of these targeted towards children, particularly for the later and cheaper brownie camera. Eastman also gave a use to the camera, and some of his advertisements told the buyers exactly what they could do with it. He made a clear reason for them to buy it. Take a look at these ads, encouraging people to record their vacations or special moments with it. Or these that show people recording nature's beauty. This one tells people that they can use the camera to do their advertising. Eastman's success continued, with him establishing control of the market for films. He continued developing and expanding, 
even with some setbacks, including Henry Reichenbach and some of his other employees defecting. On the whole, he treated his employees well, though, paying them well enough to avoid any unions forming and giving bonuses to employees who came up with new ideas or had served the company for a long time. His customers were very satisfied with the product. Here are a few quotes about that. My first hundred pictures are highly satisfactory. Their excellence and beauty surpassed my hopes. It is the greatest boon on the earth to the travelling man to be able to bring home a complete photographic memorandum of his travels. It will be my constant companion. I believe this is the first camera that has ever been brought on the market that could be put in an ordinary man's hands and expect to get results. Eventually, in 1900, he released the Brownie camera. This was a lighter and cheaper version of the Kodak that sold for just $1, only $36 today. Now photography had an option for everyone. In 1912, Richard McLaren, president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, approached Eastman asking for a donation to his university for a new building project. Eastman agreed to give two and a half million dollars on the condition that he was able to remain anonymous. He made donations to MIT, the University of Rochester, the Tuskegee Institute, and many other educational schools and institutions. In his own words, the progress of the world depends almost entirely upon education. Fortunately, the most permanent institutions of man are educational. They usually endure even when governments fail. Eastman donated a lot of money to various dental and medical clinics. He believed that this was a cause that could benefit many children and improve their quality of life. He funded the construction of the Alexander Street Clinic in Rochester by donating $402,972.80. At this clinic, children could receive dental care for just five cents, about $1.50 today. He then went on to establish similar clinics throughout Europe in cities where his company had offices. The goal was to set an example that other cities could follow to set up similar clinics. He also donated $5 million to the University of Rochester's dental and medical clinic. Here, the way medical education worked changed. Instead of being primarily an apprenticeship model, students were given more scientific education. In 1917, Eastman turned his attention to the war effort. He offered to help produce chemicals for waterproofing aeroplane wings, and to set up a school of aerial photography. As this technology was developed, it helped provide valuable reconnaissance information. He also provided a perhaps less obvious benefit to the war. Families were able to send pictures from home of children and family events to fathers who could not be there to see them. The picture of a family member kept by a soldier to remind them of home and what they were fighting for is still something we see in our media today. Regardless of your view of the First World War, it is clear that Eastman cared about his country and wanted to continue to make a difference. Despite not having a lot of musical talent, Eastman quite enjoyed listening and contributing to the art in his own way. In 1921, he established the Eastman School of Music, and he would employ some of the performers who graduated from there to regularly play music for him. One of his ideas about music was that there were plenty of performers, but not enough listeners. One way he tried to increase the number of listeners was by donating $15,000 to public schools for musical instruments. This would help some children become performers, but would also grow in them a love of music. His next project was the construction of the Eastman Theatre. At this venue, music would be able to accompany dance and silent films. In his own words, People who are not interested particularly in music will come to an appreciation of its beauty and the place it ought to occupy in their lives. In his own home, he ensured he had plenty of music. He hired Harold Gleason as his personal organist and allowed him to teach organ at the School of Music. He was expected to play for an hour each morning, starting at 7.30 except on Sundays, when he would start at 8. Whenever Eastman had guests, he would always introduce Gleason to them. 
One of these guests was Prince Gustav Adolf, the son of the Crown Prince of Sweden. When addressing royalty, you're meant to address them as your royal highness. However, Eastman seemed to think that this was too formal. Instead, he introduced Prince Gustav Adolf as just Prince to Gleason. The prince was a little bit surprised and caught off guard, but quickly collected himself and held his hand out to the organist for him to shake. In 1925, Eastman officially retired from Kodak, although he was associated with it for the rest of his life. After this decision, he embarked on a six-month trip to Africa. It seems he decided on this adventure, not in spite of the many dangers associated with the continent, but because of them. He wanted an adventure. It began in the Kedong Valley, where he then journeyed to Paradise Lake. Here, a log cabin was built for Eastman, specifically placed near the elephant trail so that he could film them as they lumbered towards the lake. Ever the innovator, on the trip there, Eastman set up a shower bath using a hose and a canvas pail. As was normal for the time, Eastman did some big game hunting, although he made sure to stay within the limits of the laws of the time. However, it seems his favourite part of this experience wasn't the collection of trophies, but the thrill he got from the constant danger he was in. One of the most impressive stories came when he spotted a rhinoceros and decided to get closer to film it. Then the rhino charged. Oza Johnson, a photographer and adventurer who was on the trip with Eastman, recounted the event. Eastman stood quietly, facing the animal, and then... When snorting and ferocious, it was within perhaps 15 feet of him, he simply sidestepped it, and actually touched its side as it passed. The rhino, growing momentarily more enraged, whirled to make a second pass, when Percival's gun brought him down. Sometime later, as Eastman showed the footage to some surgeons, they were horrified that he had taken such a risk. The rhino was only five steps away from Eastman, and its momentum took it another three steps before it finally collapsed. A lot could have gone wrong. What if Percival didn't actually kill it, or the gunpowder was a dud? Eastman quietly responded by saying, well, you've got to trust your organisation. In 1928, Eastman returned to Africa despite his declining health. This trip started in Egypt, with him sailing along the Nile to Egyptian Sudan. Then, he travelled by car to Uganda. Along the way, Eastman shot a lot of film of the wildlife, and some photos of him were even taken walking through Kodok. In Uganda, Eastman was able to achieve his goal of shooting a white rhinoceros and an elephant. However, when they went to collect the elephant, they found it was missing a horn. Eastman, who had many false teeth, responded by saying, that's alright, we'll have a false one made for him. On the way home, trying to save money, Eastman changed his spot on the train from first class to an old wooden sleeping car. This resulted in him experiencing another adventure, as the car caught fire in the middle of the night. Eastman managed to escape the fire, wearing a slipper on one foot and a shoe on the other, as well as with his trousers over his bright green pyjamas. After his second trip, Eastman's health got worse and worse. By 1930, he was diagnosed with spinal stenosis, which was irreversible and would eventually result in Eastman being confined to a wheelchair. On March 14, 1932, George Eastman rewrote his will, signing away the majority of his money to the University of Rochester. A gunshot could then be heard as he ended his own life. Beginning to succumb to sickness, he didn't want to be a burden and have to rely on others to keep himself alive. He left behind a great legacy, having created an entire industry with brilliant innovations and an amazing marketing strategy. He built a company from the ground up, leading it through economic depressions, periods of worker unions and uprisings. He never had a union formed in his own business. He simply treated his workers too well for them to need it. He survived lawsuits from other inventors and the government, a world war, and finally set it up to survive long after his death. He contributed a lot of resources to improving many educational institutions and other causes with his philanthropy.